Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the treasures behind Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 8, The Death Day Party. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Okay, so uh, let me just say right out of the gate, right up there with the heist to steal the locket uh, in book seven yeah. from the ministry, mm-hmm. this is this has got to be one of my lesser favorite events of the entirety of the saga. The death day party. The death day party. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that like we ended chapter seven and I saw the chapter art and I saw the chapter eight and I saw the title and I was like, ah, oh, man, we're like, I was like, we're like, I, I normally I'm so enamored with everything to do with the series. It's all so much fun. And yeah. I'm always, I, I always enjoy getting lost in the magic. And then this one popped up and I was like, Ah, next week's episode is going to be, I'm going to have to really dig deep for this one. And then I will say that I read the chapter and I was like, this is actually, I mean, it is fun. It is fun. A A lot of very interesting things happen. A lot of interesting things get set up. There's like a weird amount of drops for like book six stuff that happens in this particular chapter. Um, You do get like a a much more up close uh, look at all of the ghosts. The Chamber of Secrets is like officially opened. So that's exciting. That's true. Um, So there, there are some things that happen, but it's like this is one of the things they didn't put it in the movie. They just sort of like um, they just instead of uh, going to the death day party, Harry just discovers what the cat on the same day as he does the detention. Is that right? I think I don't so. Know. Yeah, I was trying to I was trying to remember exactly how this goes. And on that exact note, let's just talk about the 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 cat itself because it is also part of the chapter. Oh, what's art. the chapter art? All right. And and I say the cat as if we don't know the cat to be Mrs. Norris. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the chapter art itself depicts Mrs. Norris looking. <laughs> I mean, and, and I mean this in the most <laughs> loving, loving way, uh, per the internet and memes possible. But, but rather cat derpish. Yeah, it's pretty you know? derpy. There, I think there's even like maybe I, I think it's a little bit of like a tongue sticking out. Yes, and like definitely. Some, some frayed whiskers coming off of poor, poor Mrs. Norris there. Um, it actually gives much more of like a like a potentially empathetic feeling towards a cat that otherwise is generally regarded as being like the worst. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is the worst, but it's like you probably still don't want her dead. No, no, of yeah, course not. Right, yeah, yeah, never. Um, but I was just saying, I feel like there, maybe maybe like a tick more endearing per mm-hmm. the chapter art than I usually feel towards the character itself. The one thing that I'm most curious about is what Mrs. Norris was doing with her tail wrapped around this this uh, torch. Do you know that is an interesting note because I was like I was going to say well, well clearly Ginny just hangs her on the torch post petrification <laughs> that's dark it is dark but also maybe impossible right because if you're petrified the tail wouldn't bend it wouldn't bend yeah for right. sure so you would almost need like the tail to already be like pre curled pre, pre curled <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's like i don't really know because the other thing too at least in the chapter art depicts like a flaming torch yeah so like you could imagine a world where maybe mrs norris would be like posted up like parked on top of like a like a lantern or something like yeah. mounted on the side of the wall and then like like just sort of like swung down and yeah. just sort of like dangling but i do feel like the position the compromise position that we find mrs norris in doesn't work quite as well as it does for the rest of the characters in the the ways in which we find them per their petrification. Yeah. If that if that tracks. I guess there's water on the ground, so maybe she jumped up on the torch to avoid the water because she's supposed to have seen it in the reflection. Yeah, that's a good point. I, that's I good guess point. that's possible. It's but not, it still doesn't seem like she would wrap her tail around it. Not necessarily. I mean, it doesn't feel completely broken to me. Like, I know that cats do sort of like, you know, they're, they're always having an activity with their tail. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that was just like one of those things that I feel like I was looking at the chapter art and I was thinking about it as I dove into this chapter. And I was like, it is kind of odd that this is this is how because it's that's the thing. This is the first attack we have. And the fact that Mrs. Norris is hanging from the lamppost is pretty like grim. It is pretty grim because it. I, I mean, it, I, I feel like we're just splitting hairs. So it feels like what's most likely happened is that Ginny put her up there. OK, OK, is what I is what I think. Um, I, I don't think that should be possible based on what what you know petrification supposedly does. supposedly does yeah um, but uh, even when I saw the chapter art I was like is this right why is she hanging from a torch I always like imagine her hanging from the ceiling and then you could you know just you could tie the rope to the end of her tail despite the shape I think that's how it is in the movie too she's just like hanging from the ceiling 
Hey, is that right? Am I remembering this so completely wrong? I don't know. Maybe maybe not. I haven't. I don't know. I haven't watched Chamber of Secrets in a while. But in this chapter, it does actually say Mrs. Norris, the caretaker's cat, was hanging by her tail from the torch bracket. So okay, there we go. the chapter art is in fact correct. <laughs> in fact correct per the canon. There we go. When in doubt, count the books, not the movies. Yes. Sound good? Sound good. Sounds good. Okay. So the other kind of interesting thing about this particular chapter as like an over uh, overarching theme is something always happens on Halloween. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, which is which is kind of interesting uh, just because it, it's like we know about the defense against the dark arts position being uh, cursed and like no no teacher is able to like last for more than a year. Yeah. But it's also like, you know, last year and year one, this is like when Quarrel lets the troll in and year two, you know, it's the death day party, but it's also the first attack by the within the Chamber of Secrets. Right. In prisoner of Azkaban. Technically, what's actually happening is Sirius Black is breaking into the castle. Right. Um, so it's like that's not at well, I guess it, I don't know. It It's like uh, it's perceived in the moment as a bad thing that happened. Right. Because right. everyone considers him a convicted you know, murderer and he is breaking into the castle to murder someone. It's just not who you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's for much more understandable reasons. <laughs> yeah, right. Also, yes. also true. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Um, but th there's some curiosity in my mind as to like whether or not Halloween itself was also cursed uh, like in some some weird way, like where when when Voldemort's uh, backfiring Avada Kedavra, right? Because it's know. the same night that Harry is attacked as a baby is on Halloween. Yes. However, yes. to However. that end, um, Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Porpington was also murdered or was also beheaded on Halloween. Yes. So yes. it's like maybe maybe it's more to do with like the the Gryffindor Slytherin split than with Voldemort specifically. Oh. That's kind of fascinating because right. he is the ghost of Gryffindor. Because he is the ghost of Gryffindor. And then, yeah. and then the night. Okay, let's let's think this through for a second because that's interesting. So then, the night of Voldemort's attack, you would have Slytherin attacking Gryffindors. So that is an easy one to to solve. Yeah, L Lily and James both being Gryffindors. Right. And yes. Hit Tom Riddle being a Slytherin. Yes. Um, and then. I guess technically in year one, you would have the troll attacking Harry, Ron, and Hermione, who are Gryffindors on behalf. I mean, it's Coral, who's a I mean, Ravenclaw. Yeah. I mean, Voldemort is on the back of his head at that point. Yes. So, and influencing him. Yes. So yes. That, that would count as Slytherin. I, I think, think that would count as Slytherin. He attacks the castle in some way. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Um, Chamber, pretty abrupt Slytherin attack. <laughs> yes. It's over. <overt laughs> literally fact. on the wall. <laughs> right. 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 Yes. Um, and, and, but at the hands even of a Gryffindor in the way of Ginny. Yeah. Um, like, who who's writing on the wall. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. And then you have, I suppose uh, prisoner gets a little trickier because you would have like a Gryffindor attacking a Gryffindor, but a Gryffindor who has betrayed um, themselves to Voldemort. Also true. Yes. Yeah. Or, in, yeah. In, a, in a way that was so specific that you had um, a group of Gryffindors who were all friends and the one who betrayed was betraying on behalf of a Slytherin. So there's, right. there's could, a little bit of that. You could count that, I suppose. Then Goblet of Fire, you have uh, Barty Crouch Jr. putting Harry's name in the goblet. Do we know Barty Crouch Jr.'s house? It must be Slytherin. It must be Slytherin. Yeah. Okay. Makes you wonder what Barty Crouch Sr.'s house was. That is also very interesting. Yeah, I guess we don't know. I'm assuming it's Slytherin. Yeah. yeah. Um, but okay. so that that uh, happened because his name comes out of the goblet on Halloween. Right, right. Right. Um, and then what happens in order? On, I know. I was trying to think know. of order. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what happens? Uh, something. Surely, surely something happens. Uh, something. By this. It must be really obvious. People are like, guys, come on. I know. Yeah. The and big I'm like, one. I know. Mr. One. Weasley gets attacked at Christmas. Uh <laughs> I know, but anyway, something so something with Umbridge. I don't know. This this feels like a really fun thing to count to me as part of the lore. Like like maybe the divide because what we've always said when we go back to the founders saga in our head is that like what you're going to watch is like the most contagious and fun and like exciting friendship between Salazar and Godric. Yeah, to the point where it's like like everybody wants that that friendship that friendship. Like yeah. it has to be it has to be the best in every way right so that when it when it fractures it's it's, it's utterly heartbreaking it's terrible yeah yeah but i like the idea that it would happen on halloween yeah and then, and then every halloween there's like like a notable event that happens that that demonstrates a fracture between the houses right yes yeah. that yeah that is exactly i think uh so i can see that being like a, a thing where it's like it's just the the like hogwarts has been cursed this whole time <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> on yeah. Halloween or something. something always happens. I don't know. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, no, that's 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 so. Or maybe it wouldn't happen every time, but it's like when Voldemort's there, then it's more like Slytherin himself is in the castle kind also, of things. Yeah, you know? I mean, you can't discount the fact that as the actual heir of Slytherin, yeah. which which even that I mean could easily play 
into it because we're not ever told anything about Salazar's own family. Yeah. Um, which I think is kind of interesting because he must have had at least like offspring of one kind. He must have had offspring of some kind. Yes. Which, which yeah, the, I mean, the curiosity would be like, like what happened there or why or whatever. Right. And so. I guess you're supposed to think they eventually marry into the Gaunts. Eventually. At some point down yeah. the line. And somewhere in there is the Cadmus Peveril line gets mixed in with the Slytherin line. Arguably before or, or uh, Yeah, after. we don't know whether yeah. it's before or after. I've tried to look that up so many times that people are like, yeah, it's hard to say. Hard because enough. everyone tries to cite the date on the grave in the movie for the Peverils, and it's like that's not necessarily canon. Yeah, that that's like, you know, that, that puts too much too much power to like the prop designer, which well done on the prop. But yeah. but it's like it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, we we can't we can't let that be the dictating force behind, yeah. you know, what we consider it like to be to but we also don't know when Hogwarts was founded. <laughs> but the, uh, that's okay. So this is the other. I know we're we're way off the rails, and I'm so sorry about that. Uh, but I I feel like the the thing that I would love about the Peverils predating the founders is that the, it would it provides opportunity for even the founders to be dealing with powerful magical artifacts. Right. But like for the most part, you think of the founders as kind of being like the the dawn, if you will, of like wizard kind. Right. But in reality, they're just the ones who who form like the first official like communities, I feel like, within the wizarding world. Right. Um but but that doesn't mean that there can't be cool, powerful, dark Oh for sure. I mean they make powerful obje objects themselves. They do indeed. You know, they each yeah. have their own. It's like it's kind of interesting in that way. It's like you have like Voldemort, that's the collection Voldemort's going for. He's not looking for like the Deathly Hallows. He's looking for like the Hogwarts Hallows or something. I, the you know? whole the Hogwarts Hallows. Right, yeah. Oh man, Halloween. Hall oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I guess that makes sense because it's like Death's Day or whatever. Death's Day. Yeah, that does yeah, make sense. Death. But Hallow, Hallow means like holy object or something. Well, yeah. So I, there's something to that. There is. That's, you're right. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's okay. There's good. something okay. there. Okay. Anyway. Well, we haven't even gotten one sentence into this. <laughs> into this. Uh, I know. Well, I mean, we had to. We had to. We had to sidetrack. But anyway. Uh, well, yeah, of course so we always do. I the the first paragraph I love it is so good um, it is talking about how like October arrives and spreads a damp chill over the grounds and everyone gets a cold and you know it's like as an example of how that was affecting people Ginny Weasley who'd been looking pale was bullied into taking some by Percy like what a great sentence all around because one it is actually it is actually telling you that Ginny is pale, which you're supposed to assume is because of the cold weather, which right. it's not. It's because yes. she's opening the chamber. Yes. And then in the same sentence, she is bullied by Percy into taking some potion. So it's like in one sentence, not only are you told who the culprit is, but you are dissuaded away from that person and meant to look at Percy, who I guess is supposed to be the red herring as like this jerk brother. I know th this. This could be its own video essay is the failure of the, the creation of Percy as the red herring in this yeah, book. Yeah, it's just <laughs> like like it's there and it's there consistently. It's just I can't take Percy seriously enough to I think know. it was him. I just like I, I, yeah, I know people told me they thought it was Percy. I was like, I don't like I believe you and I you know as I read it it's like yeah there's lots of stuff throwing shade at him but it's just like it's it doesn't feel like throwing shade it just feels like it's in character it's just in character yeah yep, yep absolutely absolutely um, so then we you know we scroll down we get like th this is like this is one of those chapters that I think is also jam-packed with like lots of uh, like little factoids that can totally trip us up during like Jay versus Ben episodes oh we're, this, we're, yes this was a trip uh, there were so many things I circled that was like that's trivia that's trivia that's trivia right right like this is like one of those where it's like like how large are what were Hagrid's pumpkins compared to in the death day party in Chamber of Secrets and it's like okay how big could a pumpkin conceivably be let me like like a Volkswagen Beetle or something you know like like what are we what are we talking well, I, here I just read this and I don't even know what it is you don't even remember Man, no it's, it's garden sheds garden sheds garden I remember sheds. it said three three people could sit inside of they one they could indeed just yeah. like they could in a garden shed I feel like more I could fit more than three people in a garden shed what kind of garden I shed do think. you have I don't know I'm thinking about like the shed next to Mama Scott's house. <laughs> our, <laughs> our, our childhood neighbor. Our childhood neighbor slash babysitter. You know, like the shed you like see sitting in the parking lot at Lowe's. We're like, we'll just deliver this to your house. Dude, I'm, I actually covet one of those yeah. sheds. I need a place to store my lawnmower. But anyway, yeah. not the point. Um, but yeah, so this is one of those. It's where like it's a like, small house. It is like a small house. Yeah. yeah a she shed. Yeah, a she, a she shed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For, for you and your two best friends. <laughs> 
<laughs> what I'm saying, yeah, but more, you can fit more than two. Right, yeah, I got right, you, I yeah. got you, yeah. Um, but then we, we scroll down a little bit. This is like one of those things that I think really uh, lit the fire underneath us under the theory that Filch is in fact a poltergeist. Oh, yeah. Which is probably like this chapter, I was like, oh, this is the chapter that really breaks our Filch is the poltergeist theory. No, it and does not. It doesn't at all. I thought it did. It helps I, it. I was like, I thought for sure, and I want to get to it. I won't, even, I won't spoil it right now. But um, basically what happens is Harry uh, has been having to deal with this cold rainy weather in a way that is slightly unique because Oliver Wood is still like all about uh, his training sessions for oh, Quidditch. I highlighted that Oliver Wood's enthusiasm for regular training sessage, however, was not dampened. I just said never. I lo- Oliver Wood's like tunnel vision for Quidditch is amazing. I never realized how present it was. Yes. Yeah. No, <laughs> like he cares about nothing else. Also, before you get to whatever you're going to say, I also love that it, there, like two sentences later it says Fred and George who'd been spying on the Slytherin team. It's just like, oh, like Oliver's so concerned about spies because he does it. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah this, is, this is like the classic. What is it like deflecting or whatever where it's like it's like, you know, um, if, if you're engaging in some kind of like specific behavior where you're being like sneaky about about something yeah. then you think everybody else is being sneaky and it's like no you're just like reflecting your own behaviors back onto other people mm-hmm. and so that's exactly like that that's why wood's paranoid is because it's exactly the kind of thing wood would do yeah um which is hilarious but so what i was going to say <laughs> is that um yeah so the the from all these extra quidditch training sessions uh harry keeps entering the castle splattered with mud which is it, it's always kind of like one of those funny things for a couple of reasons the the first is that like quidditch is a sport played in the air um, yeah. So it doesn't feel like there should be that much. There should be that much mud. They might be extremely wet, and I suppose yeah. you have to walk from somewhere. Although this is even one of those where I'm like, I'm in my head. I'm like, oh, well, they probably land in the middle of the pitch and then have to walk over to the locker rooms to change. And I'm like, like why would they land? Why in the would middle you do of the that? Pitch instead yeah. of just like landing on like the the little like walkway to the to the locker room? Yeah, like fly as yeah. It's like Harry's muddy from practice. From the walk to the castle, right, right, not right. from practice actually. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like it's like actually practice had no mud whatsoever, but but also, uh, yeah, we're we're super muddy because we have to walk across the property to get there. Right, even yeah. though we could fly to the front door. You could fly to the yeah. front door. Yes. Um, so the, the thing that's always stood out to us about this particular thing, and I may be jumping ahead a little bit though, is just that it makes Filch so upset because yes. he has to clean up the mud that apparently Harry, who has now entered the castle by himself, where's the rest of the team? Where is the rest of the team? You know, it's like he, he's like about to get like detention for walking around being muddy, doing a like school shang- sanctioned sport yes. that at least six other people and possibly two Slytherin spies should also be returning from. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I know. No mention of the Slytherin spies who were clearly out there watching the Gryffindors. Almost certainly. Yeah. Almost certainly. Yeah. So, but anyway, the point is, is that like Filch is like, oh my God, it's going to take me forever to clean up. And it's like, why is it going to take why? you so long? It should not take you that long, dude. Like, yes. I think like, especially because it's like, he says it's like an, a- an extra hour of scrubbing for me. And it's like in, in um, what is Order of the Phoenix, uh, Fred and George unleash their portable swamp into one of the corridors. Yes. And it's like, Umbridge can't figure out how to get rid of it, but like when you know she finally leaves Flitwick, I think it says Flitwick like gets rid of it with like a wave of his wand. Yes, like he does it like instantly. Yes, and it's like Filch's whole job, like part of Filch's whole job is keeping the castle clean, and it's like he should be one of the best people at magic. I know we can't do magic, to, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, right. right but right. it's like. The point is that cleaning up enormous swamp sized messes for wizards is as easy as waving your wand once. Yes. Especially like maybe not every single wizard would know how to do that. But if your job is keeping the castle clean, then you should be able to do that. Like the person whose job it is to clean the castle in a magical place should be someone who can do magical cleaning spells well. You'd expect them to be adept yes. in this particular field. Right. Yeah. On, on the other hand, though, uh, in a completely non-magical world, um, it it does seem like the task of keeping a castle clean yeah. sounds like an oxymoron. <clears throat> it does. Like, it's yeah. like I can't imagine trying to keep an entire structure built of stone clean. Especially by yourself. Like uh, not only he's like the caretaker, so it's like he's supposed to. He's a, is he in charge? Is he like the custodian? And the security guard. Oh, but don't forget, Jay. There are also house elves. Oh, oh, that's <laughs> right. There are house elves at the castle. Like, why is Filch doing? Why is it his job to clean it? I, I Jay, I have no idea. House I have elves no idea. clean the Gryffindor common room every night. And it seems like house elves are exceptional in in this yes. regard. Yeah, and they like it. Right, and can do it magically. Right, right. Oh, no, I know, I know. None of it makes Not sense. Not that they should have to. No, of course. Right. No, yeah, but like, yeah. but the, but that is how it is in here. And like, why is 
is Filch doing anything? Nothing about Filch makes sense. The only thing makes the only thing that makes sense is that he is a poltergeist and like this is his lot in life. Yes, which I feel like is just going to be like reinforced <clears throat> multiple times as as the chapter unfolds. But anyway, yes. so so uh, <clears throat> important details to keep an eye on. Harry tracks mud into the castle. Yeah. Um, from there, he runs into nearly headless Nick, yes. who I believe is kind of like staring emotionally out the window at the mm-hmm. rain or something. Um, there, there's particularly I feel like a couple of um, uh, like there's a line here that basically says that Harry was able to look through uh, Nick at the window, like at the rain that was coming on, like coming down outside. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's just like a, like a tiny little ounce of setup for the scenario that you can see through ghosts into yes. something else. So when Justin Finch Fletchley is has his basilisk attack this is sort of like the like ah yes because you can see through ghosts enough to where you could also yeah. like have your your vision sort of like just mildly impaired enough to only be uh petrified instead of of killed right uh, yeah so there's there's that um go ahead oh i was gonna say there is down at the bottom it says or you learn how uh nick was executed that he got hit 45 times in the neck with a blunt axe um, which is just sounds terrible. Um, but the question we always have about this particular line is, did this particular event happen at Hogwarts? Because like the ghost is at Hogwarts. So you kind of think it would like would if it happened somewhere else, would you then just migrate to Hogwarts because you were a Gryffindor? I, I know. Yeah, this is the strange one because it's kind of like as like um as the house ghosts themselves like it seems it seems like there are other ghosts that do reside in the castle but the the specific ones that are attached to each of the respective houses it seem like they have like a like a higher position of notoriety yeah like like he is the the house ghost he's the house ghost so but then the big thing that i think you were possibly alluding to is that when we do enter the um room of hidden objects yeah in half blood half blood Prince. prince Uh, where Harry hides the book, the Half-Blood Prince's book, Uh, you can see, like, leaning against the wall, there's a specific line that says there's, like, a bloodied axe. Yeah. And it's kind of one of those things where it's like, why would a school ever have a bloodied axe? Ah, but yet we know that there was someone in the school who was failed to be beheaded by an axe. By an axe. So, So and yeah, yeah. uh, So it does seem like maybe it happened at the school. I guess we know that the gray lady and the bloody baron didn't die at the school and they're still back there. They didn't die at the school, but they are both very significantly tied to the school. Like the gray lady is... Is a Ravenclaw. Is a Ravenclaw. Is a Ravenclaw. Like a and the, yeah, and then the Bloody Baron, of course, is just like in love with her. So maybe he follows her there. And also, his death is as a result of a mission on behalf of the school. Also true. Yes. Yeah, so true. you can see maybe why he would return there. Um, otherwise, it seems like uh, I looked up if there was any circumstances under which we knew like what the circumstances around his death were. Basically, it was in 1492, which is confirmed later in the chapter. And we know that it happened on Halloween. Um, and he was there. I guess there used to be like um, on like one of the official Harry Potter websites. You could see like when he goes to make his speech and gets interrupted later. You can read the limerick he actually was trying to say. It's a, kind of like a little song. Right? It's like a little like song. A sorting hat song. Almost. Yes. Yeah. So it says, "Alas for the eve when I met Lady Grieve, a strolling in the park in the dusk. She was the." Bel- she was of the belief I could straighten her teeth. Next moment, she sprouted a tusk. So it sounds like basically uh, he finds a woman and says he can straighten her teeth and then accidentally um, gives her tusks. Yes. And outs himself as a wizard and uh, is then sentenced to death. He's sentenced guess. to death. Yeah. Yeah. But then it makes you wonder like, if it happens at Hogwarts, certainly they've already known about wizards. You know, like it's a wizarding place. That is also that's a that and that's a really good point yeah. as well. Yeah. The other thing though is that I never really considered this that much, but like Sir Sir Nick, his name is Sir Nicholas, which means he was knighted at some point. Sure. Right. Which is I, I thought was kind of cool when he must have been knighted then by. Um, King Henry the seventh because he was the king of England at the time. This is yeah, we, we looked up this little factoid, but I find it to be kind of strange because I'm pretty sure uh, King Henry the seventh is followed by King Henry the eighth, who is notable for specifically his beheadings of his wives. Right. And so it, it's kind of interesting like to choose the 500 year mark for a couple of reasons. In fact, yeah. because I think this is the first time throughout the series that we're ever given the date 
at which the story is taking place. Oh, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about like the Nimbus 2000, the Nimbus 2001, and the fact that these books would have been released in, you know, 1997, 1998 range. Right. So you could easily imagine a world where somebody would be using a naming convention attached to the year yeah. that everything was that was taking place within. However, once we discover that he was killed or, or yeah, killed 500 years prior, it's like, okay, now the story is taking place in 1992. Now, right. now that is a confirmed fact that has been like added to the overall canon. Right. So and really, this is the first time that the naming convention for the Nimbus is, has been proven to Yeah, it doesn't make sense. sense. Yeah, so I yeah. suppose as you're reading Sorcerer's Stone, it it just was the Nimbus 2000, and you'd have been like, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, 2000, the year, it's coming up. Right. That's probably when the story is taking place, but no. Uh, Sir Nicholas... De Mimsy Porpington's 500 death day party confirms the year as 1992. But the other odd thing about it, it well, I mean, to me, is just simply the selection of the year 1492 for him to have been killed during. Just just because 1492 is quite a notable year. Right. Like if you're going to select any one year from the like from the century that is the 1400s, it's probably the one most people would pull off the top of their head. Right. Yeah. You like know, <laughs> because it is it is happens to be the year that Christopher Columbus like set sail or discovered the Americas in a sense. Right. Yeah. So um, it, it's like, is there supposed to be like a like a, a nod to that somehow? That would be Spain that sent right. Christopher Columbus, which seems like, you know, no, no connections whatsoever. So anyway, I mean, it's it's just kind of one of those things where I'm like, why this year in particular? Like, like clearly it had to be a choice for some reason. <clears throat> I mean, it could have just been like 500 sounds like a fun round number to be celebrating the death day party for and... If you're writing the book, you know what year it's supposed to be taking place in. That's also so true. So you just I have mean, to just math it out, and then it's just, oh, it just happens to be that. Right. And, and I suppose the other detail that would be somewhat relevant here is that we're about to discover that the Chamber of Secrets is being opened for the first time in 50, five zero years. Yeah. So it's also kind of like we've got like a 500 years ago than like a 50 years ago. That's true. So 1942. Oh, that's it. 1942, 1492. It's the same numbers. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Because that would be when the Chamber of Secrets was opened. Yeah. One nine four two versus yep. one four nine two. Yeah. Ah. Uh, that, oh, that's interesting. I bet. I bet that's the that's like the little puzzle pieces sliding into place. <laughs> I never noticed that before, though. That is cool. Yeah, it is all the same numbers. Yeah. Anyway, so um, this is another piece of trivia that I know I have gotten wrong before, though, because what we discover is that what uh, Nick is lamenting is that he is not being uh, permitted to join the headless hunt, uh, which makes him rather sad, uh, and he receives this letter from. Uh, Sir Patrick Delaney Podmore and that is like one of those questions where it's like who rejects his request to join it and I can never remember Sir yeah. Patrick Delaney Podmore. Mm -hmm. You, you got to <clears throat> wonder whether or not these two knew each other in life because they're both sirs which means they're both That's knighted. That's true. So it's like is there a chance that this is like some kind of like rivalry or was it Lady Grieve from the song? Lady Grieve, yeah. Lady Grieve. So like I wonder if like maybe maybe uh, like Sir Patrick Delaney Podmore was a, a suitor. And, oh, right. And, as was Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Porpington. Right, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were caught together and right, trying right. to uh, win her affections. And he was like, well, I'll straighten your teeth. And she's like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, bet, yeah. I mean, was that like an actual reenactment? That was now? probably, I mean, yeah, I felt like that's I was how it probably went down. I kind of felt like I was Did you think it. you were watching Bridgerton for a second? I do, for one hot second, I yeah. sure did. I yeah. sure did, yeah. Man. A little less heavy breathing, but I, I feel like I got oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So um we we yeah, we learned that Nick is rejected from the headless hunt by so properly <laughs> so properly decapitated Podmore. <laughs> I, I just love that title. <laughs> He's like so petty about it. Yes, yes indeed. Um and then uh we get introduced in for the first time in this book to Mrs. Norris as a reminder that she exists because of course she's about to get petrified. Yes, yep, yep. So this is this is like one of those things because I think this chapter in particular does does this a little bit where it's like let me tell you some things that you need to know that are going to be relevant as the story unfolds. Like, yeah, even even as the death day party, like as we get there, we get our first ever introduction to moaning Myrtle. Yeah. And that's one of those things where obviously we know that like Myrtle is going to be very important to the overall story. And I, I wonder if this was like a struggle where it was like, I need to find a way to have them meet Myrtle before being in the first floor girl's bathroom right you know and, and so it's like one of those things where it's like 
I need an event that would bring ghosts into one place. This could be the thing, a uh -huh. death day party. Because the other thing that always stands out to me is that like the death day party, it makes so many massive assumptions, like with all like absolutely like disgusting yeah. kinds of food and stuff. Like it feels like the type of thing that would belong at a haunted house, but possibly disregards the fact that these were all just human people who would have like regular human appetites. Right. And and I don't understand. Like I, I guess the idea they, they suggest is that like the more dis disgustinger the food is, the the closer they could potentially be to tasting it. I know, but it still says like, can you taste it? And he says almost. So no. So no, it's like so. But like, like so why your palate wouldn't change. You wouldn't all of a sudden like I, I don't think in death all of a sudden you'd be like, ah, there's nothing more than I want than, than a giant bowl of larva. Oh, I something. know. Right. The, uh, the that that part is so gross. It just seems like it doesn't make sense. Like you actually still can't taste it. So there seems like there's no point to go to the trouble. And also who set it up like they can't handle objects. I know. I know? wonder the exact. So this is something where I was like, this feels like this. This to me feels like it's got Dumbledore written all over it, but it would be like Dumbledore out of respect for ghost culture would permit the house elves to prepare foods on behalf of the ghosts like that to, to me that's what i would read it as yeah like, i mean something like that had to they needed mortal help getting the party set up exactly yeah yeah this this something. can't be done with without that without yeah. the aid i yeah. suppose the other function here is that not only does it introduce harry ron and hermione to myrtle ahead of time and us the audience to her yes. but it removes her from the crime the scene of the crime with mrs norris later also because true. otherwise maybe you just immediately ask her but now you won't because she wasn't there right. but of course if anyone had asked her in the last 50 years we could have solved this that's the other thing nobody asked myrtle about her death i know that in I, 50 I, years i can't tell if this is just supposed to be playing into like the the trope that is like myrtle's like feeling uh, like as someone who feels like they're being like overlooked is the joke supposed to be like yeah Myrtle was so overlooked that even when we found her dead in a bathroom nobody asked her what happened right, right. like it's like surely they would surely sure, they I know would. it's like yeah <laughs> even the staff right right someone must care like what what happened here also there's like a bit of a like I don't know this is like a a a, a tricky I feel like problem for Myrtle and how the basilisk petrifies people wherein if you if, if you see it through a reflection or through a mirror or through a camera or whatever the basilisk will only petrify you but like it always seems to me like glasses should count as like a form of protection because you're looking through something else like like what who Justin Finch Fletchley sees the basilisk through nearly headless Nick, so through something else, yes, and like glasses are through something else. The, it, you know, it is technically a barrier. It's like it would like, be so interesting because it would be like such an easy way to just to protect all the students. It's like, hey guys, everybody just wear shades. Everyone just wear some shades. Like you won't die then, right? right but it's right, like yeah. clearly. Like it is, I mean, if it fixes you with its stare, it's supposed to kill you. So, I mean, clearly glasses don't work because otherwise Harry would be so protected. That's also true. You know? That's also but like, true. But you know, I mean, I guess, I don't know if it's a difference between like a ref No, it can't. It's not just a reflection. I was going to try and make an excuse for the camera. Like when you look through a camera, you're actually looking through mirrors. But like there is like the ghost seeing through Nick seems the same. If anything, I mean, if anything less, if anything less, because yeah. he is not, he is not physical. He's not a physical wall right. or, or object or, or anything like he, he's like a, like an ethereal mist. Yeah. Um, well, the point is Myrtle wears glasses. <laughs> the point is Myrtle wears glasses. The other big question there is that it also possibly is the case that, uh, because we know, I think we know that Tom Riddle creates the diary Horcrux with Myrtle's death. Yes, which also means that the person creating the Horcrux does not need to be the one to actually, uh, like perform the yeah. murder. Even if, I mean, even if the basilisk is like an extension of him, or act like you know, uh, operating. acting on his orders is good enough. Right, right. To rip his soul. Yes, because he orders the basilisk to do it. It is allowing his soul to rip. Yes. Yeah. Must be the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but I mean, it's just interesting because it feels it feels overall less intimate to me. Yeah. Um. To to have it be done that way versus versus like you know, a vodka. I, you something. know what though? This that exact trope carries forward to Deathly Hallows, where um, 
Snape has killed. Where Snape has killed Nagini, but even then, even then, Nagini still has a piece of Voldemort inside of her. Is the is the belief in that that that's true? Nagini's a Horcrux already. Is the argument at all because because Snape believes? No, I'm sorry, it's not that's not it. Because Voldemort believes that Snape is the master of the Elder Wand, that it would be foolish to use the Elder Wand to then attack Snape. I think that. Like is, is, is the reasoning. If you're wondering, like, why didn't he just Avada Kedavra him? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I yeah. think that is the reasoning for why he doesn't do that. Has Nagini do it instead? And it obviously, in his mind, counts as him killing someone else because the Basilisk kills Myrtle. That's and, the argument right there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that works. But this uh, Nagini would count even more so because she's a Horcrux. Because she's a Horcrux. But, yeah. but it is the case because, I mean, he's literally talking to Snape and he's like, this is, this is really unfortunate that I have to do this because I need to be the master and you're currently the master. And so I need to be the one to kill you. So Nagini, step up, please. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> I know. It's like, like, you sure about that, bro? Because like, <laughs> it's like your your logic feels. It almost <clears throat> feels like uh, in an early draft of the story, there was a line written where, uh, like, where this would have been spelled <clears throat> out that the like that the person who was holding the Elder Wand can't attack the person who is the master of the Elder Wand out of fear of the Elder Wand backfiring because it may have just been too much of an obvious spoiler that this is exactly what's going to happen when Harry faces him down. Yes. Like yeah. it's, it's almost like we I can't really take the time to explain it. Hopefully you'll just surmise you'll just it. like get it. Yeah. As yeah. time goes on. Anyway, we're, we're like, we're like five books ahead here. So no, but um, it's all, it's also relevant to the situation. <laughs> it is. It yeah. absolutely is. I agree. I agree. So, um, but, but I mean, it's, yeah, so it's, it's very, it's very interesting. Like what counts and what doesn't count and who's operating on behalf of what, but I suppose to be fair as well. I mean, Tom Riddle is the heir of Slytherin and, the basilisk was left in the castle by Salazar Slytherin himself. I mean, it so, is Slytherin's monster, but it doesn't like share a bloodline with him. That's also true. That we know of. Whoa. Can you imagine? Mm. But what? even if that was the case, it wouldn't, it's not the same. It's just like, oh, yeah, your dad killed someone, so you killed someone. Yeah. <laughs> you true. know, and this would be like your great, 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 great grandfather or something. Right. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Probably, probably add like 15 more greats. As a giant that. snake. As a giant snake. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, as we move forward and we try to, to, to ask distinctions about things, the next thing that I think is kind of interesting is that we, we literally led this chapter, uh, that, that first sentence that you were talking about with Madame Pomfrey uh, keeping everybody healthy from their colds thanks to the pepper up potion. Um, we then learned from Nick that uh, Filch has been in a bad mood because he's got the flu. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. And it's like one of those things where it's like, does the pepper up potion not work on poltergeist i know you know you know you mm -hmm. know because it seems like th i mean this is like one of those questions where it's like like if he's a squib then the question would be like does magical healing not work on non-magical beings seems like it still would that's the question yeah i guess it? that's a good question yeah i don't yeah, know like are, are they like <clears throat> like different from like an anatomy standpoint. Yeah, like can you not use magical cures on non-magical people? I don't know. It's a yeah. good question. But mm. either which way, I think it personally alludes to the fact that uh, Filch is just not real. Oh, he's bolted. The big one is uh, what on the next page here where it where Mrs. Norris like summons Filch to the to the situation where it says drawn to the spot by the mysterious power that seemed to connect him with his foul cat and it's like first of all that mysterious power is never explained but in this chapter it is explained that Filch doesn't have any magical powers yes. so how can he not have magical powers and have a mysterious connection with this cat? Like, right. don't, math ain't math, and y'all. Math ain't math, and no, I agree with you totally. I highlighted the exact same thing. Yeah. I was just like this, this, like, how does this happen? Why does this happen? Why do we never learn? I know, you know because it does seem like <coughs> it's the case. Like, if Mrs. Norris is spotting something, then it seems like Filch is also somehow seeing it at the same time and is just always <coughs> arriving on scene, looking yeah. split. Because they're actually just one. They're they're like a shared being, a shared being of, of a poltergeist. Yes, you know, yeah. split in two. So when when, when uh, Mrs. Norris goes down, he's really losing a part of himself. That, I mean, he's angry enough about it. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You know maybe, what? Maybe. Even that tracks like like Horcruxy kind of way. Yeah. You know, Harry's fighting a Horcrux, and this is like Filch just lost like a piece of his soul a little bit. A little bit. You know, yeah. to a piece of Voldemort's soul. How about that? There you go. There you Boom. go. Boom. Okay. Nailed okay. it. Putting it all together. There it is. Okay. Let's see here. Um, 
so then we go down to Filch's office, which yep. is kind of interesting because there's a closet. Uh, his, his closet. His, his closet. His, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> a dingy windowless room. <laughs> lit, lit by Why? a single oil lamp dangling from a low ceiling. A, a faint smell of fried fish lingered about the place. Okay. So as a friendly reminder, when Dobby approaches Dumbledore about potential accommodations, I'm pretty sure Dumbledore offers him like 10 galleons a week yeah, or something I like that. I think so. Um, and weekends for, off. And weekends off. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't seem like the same Dumbledore who would be requiring Filch to work inside of a closet that smells like, you know, fried fish, fried fish. Yeah. It's just like, what? Unless, unless, of course, you know, when we go to the death day party, we know that they can kind of sort of almost potentially taste more disgusting food. So maybe the same thing is true for Filch. Pol- the Peeves is at the death day party. He is at the death day party. Yeah. Yeah. He's there. So, okay. Although you know who's not is Filch. It's Filch. Yeah. That's true. That seems classic Filch, though. So. Classic to uh, yeah, reject. Right, right. I don't know if Filch is aware that he's a poltergeist because he is so like anti. Because if he's a poltergeist, it means he is the manifestation of rule following and as we've like we've talked about this before but like the idea of magic is that doesn't really follow the rules right and so like that's why he can't do magic because he is all about following rules and magic is like the act of breaking the rules yes yeah exactly um but so then uh, also included inside of his office is going to be a highly polished (laughs) collection of chains and manacles hung on the wall behind his desk which just it seems like again i'm like i don't see a world where dumbledore would ever 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 allow those to i be know used. it doesn't seem like those would be used however this also ties into the bloody axe thing it's like why is there a bloody axe why is there chains and manacles in this place it's yeah. like because it used to be a lot more brutal they used to do executions here <laughs> apparently yeah p- apparently or someone needs to ask nick about how he died <laughs> okay so here's the question yeah because if they're if they're beheading nick i'm going back to that um if they're beheading nick the question is whether or not the uh, like the wizarding population is the one who feels like he, like because at that point in time the statute of secrecy was not officially set in place yet. I don't think that happens to like the 1700s. Right. So that might just be the punishment on behalf of wizards being like, dude, we are trying to eke out an existence over here and you're trying to impress a muggle woman by fixing her teeth? Like, come on! Dude! You compromising our whole thing we're working on here at Hogwarts where we behead people. (laughs) (laughs) It it happens like the next day. He tries to fix her teeth on October 30th and the beheading happens on the 31st. Wow. I know. Like, they're like, no time for a trial. We get what you are, Tusk Man. Tusk Man? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Try and turn our women into elephants why don't you? Yeah, huh. No, no way. No way. Nope. Um, anyway, so let's see here. What do we got next? Um, so then I think the other really important thing that we have happen is that Harry is about to possibly get like detention or it yeah. says a, a suggested sentence. A suggested sentence for, again, returning to the castle. <laughs> from a school for, sport. Yeah, for doing his practice. Yes, for doing his practice. Uh, however, there is an interference uh, when there is a loud bang on the ceiling above the office, <coughs> which made the oil lamp rattle. Peeves, sh- Filch shouted, and basically is like, I'll have you this time. I'll have you. And then without a backward glance, basically Filch leaves the office and goes running upstairs with Mrs. Norris streaking along beside him because they are the same creation. Um, this is kind of a fascinating one because of what we discover the noise is caused by. And yeah. While it is in fact Peeves, it is something that um, nearly headless Nick had done on behalf of Harry, uh, who basically convinces Peeves to knock over the black and gold cabinet that also happens to be the vanishing cabinet, mm-hmm. and not just any vanishing cabinet, but the same vanishing cabinet that Montague will eventually be stuffed inside of and lost for a period of days in Order Harry's, of the Phoenix. In Order of the Phoenix, yep. uh, it is the same cabinet that then Draco. Re- realizes uh has a a twin a it, twin yeah th- which is currently at borgen and burks the yep. same one that harry was hiding in yeah. in this same in book the same book um and that that is then what draco uh is able to mend and create the passageway between borgen and burks and hogwarts right so yeah big big setup here also i love how it's like nick's idea to help harry is to crash the cabinet and like harry eventually thinks him like oh yeah great job you totally that totally worked but like it didn't really I don't think how do you mean <laughs> like I mean he crashes the cabinet and Filch leaves to go inspect it but then Harry's like guess I should wait for Filch to come back oh yeah that's you know? true that's and it's true. like if Harry hadn't gone nosing around on Filch's desk then 
it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> right. You know, like if Felch had like put his folder away, then like he were to come back and run like, right, where were we? Oh yeah, detention. Right, right. You know? <laughs> sentencing, Jay. Yeah, sentencing. sentencing. Right, yeah. My yes, bad. Yes. Um no, it, it is it is really funny. But then in the meantime, while Harry doesn't leave the office, he happens to find the quick spell uh bit of flyer. And this is something that I have no idea if I had like like rearranged this in my head or something in my mind for whatever reason I had convinced myself that the quick spell course was something that was teaching squibs how to be magical and that's just incorrect like my right. own recollection of what the quick spell course was is wrong yeah it's, I actually wrote down the same thing it just said not really a squib solution it's not a squib solution at yeah. all so like his his having it this is not like his identifying as a squib this is just him basically just being like how can i learn how to do magic possibly maybe right and he's pretty ashamed of even owning this particular thing but when it comes down to it it just sounds like tutoring for wizards it's kind of like i mean which kind of makes sense like there's there are certain things that i've done in my life like my um like my scuba uh, training for example it's yeah. like if i were to go sc- like i haven't scuba dived in you know a long time right. like 10 years yeah and so i was like if i were to go do it again i would absolutely want a refresher before yeah. i go like deep underwater so like the quick spell course literally sounds like maybe you're like in your your like 30s 40s 50s it's been a long time since you were in school you need to t- touch up on some things yeah like it's like i could totally see this just being a thing um so i had a really originally written down like ah uh, this is the part that really like kind of argues our point about like filch being a poltergeist sounds like but then again it doesn't really do that at all just tutoring yeah i mean i don't i think he later admits or self the self identifies as a squib okay okay like so he, says, he knows i'm a i'm a uh, i might even be in the next chapter or okay something. okay so that's still that's still coming yeah maybe maybe that was the line that i th- I, I thought happened closer to the quick <clears throat> spell course right um but yeah so i mean that being said this this just goes back to the argument that filch just doesn't know just doesn't know yeah, yeah. like then it would just be the case that like it, he identifies as a squid because he can't do magic but exactly. he doesn't realize he's a poltergeist either because he can't do magic right right yeah yes yeah. um let's see uh but it's also interesting to me that like well harry's like did this mean that filch wasn't a proper wizard and it's like well it i guess so it does mean that but it's like we we know that filch can't do magic and it's like nobody's figured out that filch can't do magic <laughs> like like the students haven't picked up on the fact that he's scrubbing the floor when you definitely don't have to right i know that's such a good point it's like this doesn't feel like it would be like a like a tightly kept secret right you know like for harry to have discovered and then like like tell to everybody else it seems so much more likely that it would just be like well-known information right like as long as you not run them it's okay because you know like what's he gonna what's do, he gonna do? Yeah. Okay, i'll pull out his wand <laughs> I don't think so. Nope. Um, anyway, so yeah, so then we go back out to um, um, Harry running back into Nick, and they they kind of have their conversation about like you know I, I did that on your behalf, and Harry basically agrees to come to his death day party, which I, I did write like a little note there, like Harry's so kind, you know, like yeah. I mean I think he's sort of like a little hesitant, and he's like of of, of course, you know. But well, like, not only does he agree to go, he doesn't even bring up the fact he doesn't even bring up the fact that his that Nick and his parents share a death day. I know. You know. Yeah, I know. He's not like, wow, that's my parents stuff there too. How about that? How about well, that? I know. I know. Um, they just want to steal his thunder, you know? N- not, not one. Yeah. Not one you know day. how I'm famous? Yeah, happened to be on this exact day. On this exact day. It's kind of a hard day for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so then uh, basically Harry goes back it to Ron and Hermione, uh, where it kind of seems like Hermione's like, whoa, that's pretty neat. Like, we, we get to go to a death day party. I bet nobody alive's ever been to one. Uh, or, that, or, I, re- I highlighted that because I was like, it doesn't seem like it'd be that weird that dead people would know living people. No, it doesn't. Know? It doesn't right? seem that strange at all. I mean, this this kind of reminds me of like Coco, you know, and like the the Day of the Dead. Yeah, you know, it feels it feels like in. I mean, this that's like a, on a dedicated date. Uh, dead, you know, dedicated. Uh, <laughs> didn't even mean to. Um, but the idea of people attending their loved ones' death day parties doesn't seem like a bad thing. It actually I know, seems right? kind of like a great thing. Yeah. Like, like I, I, I sort of like. So I wrote this down. Um, like Ron says like uh like why would anyone want to celebrate the day they died uh sounds dead depressing to me and i i was like i actually find the idea of a death day party to be kind of cool because it's almost like your birthday for the afterlife a little bit i mean that's exactly what it is yeah Yeah. so it's like i don't know that like I sort of like it, um, yeah. I, but I also like Day of the Dead, like as a concept. I think it's like a like a neat way to like honor the people in your lives and, and tell those stories and, and yeah. you know. 
like kind of spiritually maybe spend time with those people. Yeah, I remember when we were doing lots of research for the movie Coco before it came out, like learning about, um, God, I can never say the name of the holiday though, like Dia de, Dia Dia de, de, Dia de los Mortos. Dia de los Mortos, yes, that. Um, and like learning that like the like American funerals are like very uh, different than other cultures where it's like a very solemn, forlorn, sorrowful, sad thing. There's grieving. And it's like, of course, someone dying is very sad. Of course. Yeah. Um, but like in other cultures, it's more of like, it like they'll still be sad that the person has passed, but like their funeral is more like a celebration of their entire life. Exactly. Which, yeah. which I feel like <clears throat> is catching on a little bit. Like I've, I've, I've heard the phrase like, like join us for a celebration of life, you know, yeah. like, like uh, that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so, so yeah, anyway, but I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, in, in sort of the overall theme of this book as as like or not even this book the the um, saga as a whole yeah. is that like death is not something to necessarily not not necessarily be feared but yeah. like also um, you know can, can be good in its in its own way so to speak it's it the, the next great adventure although Nick has never truly died according to him that's also true yeah that's that's also true because he chose he chose that ghost life yeah instead. maybe death day is not the right word I know, know? yeah <laughs> that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you became a ghost day yeah ghost day mm-hmm. which that seems a little more sad yeah, yeah it does because yeah. yeah. being a ghost actually does seem like it's it's not the preferable option right yeah you know because I think when when Harry talks to him after Sirius's death even I think Nick is sort of like yeah, Sirius would never do this. He would never choose this path. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't seem like there'd be a lot of Gryffindor ghosts, though, you know? Like, there'd be a lot more, like, the people bravely accepting death. You'd think. You'd, You'd think. think. Yeah. You know what's sort of a weird... Oh, here's a weird thought. Imagining, like, if... Because in the wizard... In the world... In the wizarding world, like, ghosts exist. Like, if, like, far enough... Do, like, do they ever fade or anything? I wonder, like, will they, like imagining some sort of like Armageddon event or like the heat death of the universe. Like is Nicholas the Minzy popping to so just sort of like floating around space. Like <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still here. I will join that headless yeah, hunt one of, these, one of these days. <laughs> no, that's hilarious. I, that's a good question, but I think probably they would yeah. just be here forever. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I don't see why not. Yeah. Um, I don't either. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really a good reason not to be a ghost. I know. Yeah. It seems like just, just that, like, I mean, that's, that's, that's honestly, I always, I always think this about villains. I'm like, everybody's always going for like immortality, and I'm like, immortality sounds exhausting. Right, because here's what you don't want: it's a situation where uh, everyone else is dead and you're not. Exactly. Right. That seems. And it's sad. like you don't want to be more immortal than the Earth itself because. Right. You're gonna have a real lonely existence for most of your life at that point. Yes. Even if you make it like another, you know, twenty thousand years, if we're being real generous, you know, before all the people are gone, like, guess what? Then you're still gonna be alive for a million billion years after that. Maybe we, with we should, nothing. Maybe we should make a video about immortality where it it discusses like the, the like like Voldemort basically surviving past all of humanity and just like sort of sitting on a rock being like, I wish I could get back into the cave, except the cave melted. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't have a great way to get to the locket and I really need to go destroy the locket. Now, oh, man, now I'm just now mm. I'm just stuck. Do but you I- suspect at that point he would feel remorse? Maybe so. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Some yeah. billion years into the future, like it, it would take. This that is long. terrible. <laughs> I got to give it up. I am. Wow. I made some mistakes. I don't. What am I a king of, you know? Right. Lord of the Flies. Lord of this real feather in my cap. Um, okay, so moving on from that, though, we got, uh, on a much lighter note, we got Fred and George Weasley trying to figure out what would happen if you fed a filibuster firework to a salamander, which I, I have to personally say uh, I wouldn't recommend doing. I know. I'm like, um, it works out, as we find out on the next page, but I highlighted that and was like, I mean, I have a guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it feels like what would happen normally to yeah. a firework, except at a salamander. Except in a salamander. Yeah. Um, it turns out that just sort of like whizzes around the world and breathes a little bit of fire and lands back in the fire, and it's okay. <laughs> and it's okay. Yeah. Well, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, the thing that I think is fascinating about this is that they must be taking care of magical creatures under Grubbly Plank. Oh, I guess so. Is yeah. That, is that right? No. Or is it? Is it Grubbly Plank? Or is it someone? No. Else? Yeah. Because it's whoever decides to enjoy the remainder of their days with their remaining limbs. Yes. What is that character's name? Oh, no. This is a good trivia. That is a good trivia. That's a Prisoner of Azkaban. Yeah, well, Prisoner well, of Azkaban trivia. Um, anyway, the point I was going to make, though, is I, I didn't... I couldn't remember if there had been a reference to Care of Magical Creatures prior to this. Um, we know that they are required 
to take uh, to to pick up a copy of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them as first years, but I couldn't remember whether or not Care of Magical Creatures had ever been referenced as like a as a course before. But they would be fourth years at this time. Uh, you, yes, Fred and George. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Okay. No, or is it one year ahead of them? Mm, what would it be? What would it be? They're not seventh years when they leave. When school. they leave. Yeah, so maybe maybe it's just one year ahead of them. Okay. Okay. That means they make it onto the Quidditch team. No, but then they're on the Quidditch team as beaters, like right away as second years. Oh, you're right. Right? Would that be the case? You are right. Would there have even been tryouts then? <laughs> huh. That's Man. Good, what year? How, yeah. It feel this feels like information we should know. It does feel like information we should know. People are like, what are you guys doing? You maybe, should know this. Maybe they just leave before the end of their seventh year. Maybe that's just it. Okay. Sure. In in Order of the Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Three W they they get three OWLs each, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's pretty good. It's pretty yeah. good. Go friend George, my faves. <laughs> um anyway, so as we as we move forward, um there's there's a description of what the what the the golden trio is missing out on in the the version of the form of the Halloween feast, uh which includes just a variety of different things. I I highlighted this because they are always details that I feel like again could be asked in trivia. Um but decorated with the usual live bats, Hagrid's vast pumpkins had been carved into lanterns large enough for three men to sit in, uh and there were rumors that Dumbledore had booked a troop of dancing skeletons for entertainment. This is another one of those where I think in Goblet of Fire there is a rumor that Dumbledore had like purchased like 1,000 barrels of mead. I know. The, Yule like, ball. T- the rumors about Dumbledore's party planning are amazing. I know. Like Dumbledore must throw some <laughs> some absolute like... Yeah, like, some real bangers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know. I was like I w- we don't get confirmation about whether or not he did get the dancing skeletons. I was like, oh yeah? Did you? I know. I mean, It th- seems very non-Dumbledore to do that because that seems like, you know, raising the dead or something it does feel a little raising the dead it also feels like like there is no there's no suggestion that that skeletons would dance of their own accord so it seems mostly like you would just be able to bewitch the skeletons themselves to dance which i'm sure dumbledore could do which he could definitely do yeah. but then the question is like are they real skeletons? are they real or? skeletons because that seems disrespectful i know yeah because we got I mean, yeah yeah like dance for me skeleton. <laughs> dance dead body <laughs> <laughs> okay, also, I looked it up, and Fred and George are two years ahead of the okay, gang. Okay, yeah. okay, that tracks, that tracks. FYI. <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much what we thought the whole time. Oh, this is another thing. We talked about this. We talked about the food earlier. When they're arriving at the death day party, It's the the they. this is how it is described. As Harry shivered and drew his robes tightly around him, he heard what sounded like a thousand fingernails scraping against an enormous blackboard. And Ron's like, is that supposed to be music? And it's like... Why would ghost music be different? I I like, know that I know, doesn't yeah. make sense, especially because later in the chapter, Ben, when the headless hunt arrives, it is to the sound of a hunting horn, meaning they can make perfectly regular musical sounds. So why ghost music is this like eerie chalkboard scratching sound makes no sense to me. I, it does seem extremely odd, especially because the ghosts otherwise like attend all the feasts and they yeah. seem to be like like they seem to enjoy enjoy being there and, and like a like a part of the action and everything. So mm-hmm. it's not like all of a sudden that like once you're a ghost, you're like, ah, uh, nothing like nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> I know. Um, well, how are they getting the instruments either? You know, like are they playing music? Are they playing music or is there a chance that every one of these uh, every one of these players in the the 30? What, what is it? The quavering sound of 30 musical saws played by an orchestra on a raised black drape platform. The question there is like, were all of these ghostly musicians playing music as upon, they died? As they died? Yeah, because like the bloody Baron saw has the chains on him. OK, I want to ask you about the chains okay. because I think this is kind of an interesting one because we, we then get a line from Ron who says, careful not to walk through anyone, said Ron nervously, and they set off uh, and they set off around the edge of the dance floor. They passed a group of gloomy nuns, a ragged man wearing chains and the fat friar, a cheerful Hufflepuff ghost. And then it says like two lines later, Harry wasn't surprised to see that the bloody Baron, a gaunt staring Slytherin ghost covered in silver bloodstains, was being given a wide berth by the other ghosts. This like is the ragged man wearing chains. It feels like that's the bloody Baron, doesn't it? Right. The bloody Baron has chains, right? I think so. Right. That's how I've always 
yeah. thought of it. So it's kind of like, it, yeah. it, I mean, and it must not be this. I mean, obviously, like, you know, hey, look, more than one ghost is allowed to have chains. Yeah, you know, obviously. It's like, it's like just be your own unique self as a ghost. Or right. However it is, you would die because that's probably the condition you were left in. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I always th- I, that, that was kind of interesting to me. I was like, oh, the ragged man wearing chains. That was the bloody baron. And then I got like one one sentence later. And I was like, no, the bloody baron is over there. I did the same exact thing. I was like, oh, that must have been him. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, obviously, it, there's just two ghosts wearing chains. Maybe that's the ghost of Christmas past. Why not? Why yeah, not? Just that at the party, it. you know? Yeah, yep. Yep. We'll take it. We'll take it. Um, and then we get Moaning Myrtle. Then we get Moaning we Myrtle. We talked about here. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. This mm-hmm. and this is sort of like my theory here is that like this whole chapter is just sort of designed to be a way to get you like a little bit more acquainted with ghosts, but also to introduce Myrtle to the trio. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's Absolutely. Sort of, that's sort of my thinking there. Um, then we get sort of like the, yeah, we get the whole food conversation, rotten fish laid on a handsome silver platter, cakes burned, charcoal black, um, you know, just sounds, I mean, it, it, who it, made the food? I don't really know. Uh, there's a Where great, do you just get maggoty haggis? I don't know if there's anything more unpleasant sounding than maggoty haggis. Pretty bad. But it also sounds like it could be a nursery rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> now, everybody, let's sing maggoty haggis. Maggoty haggis. Ew. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm going for like a raggedy Ann type something. Raggedy like Ann and yeah. maggoty haggis. Her, maggoty her haggis. best friend. Yeah. Um, either which way, though, this is sort of the setup um, as the the trio was able to then go and sort of exchange a little bit of time with with the rest of the ghosts. But mostly, I think the the big thing is that it has taken the trio away from where they would have been otherwise, so that when Harry starts hearing the voice, the rip, tear, yeah. kill, um, it, it makes them look really, really, really guilty when the rest of the, the Great Hall is released from the feast. Right. And they are now discovered right next to uh, blood written words on the wall that says the Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air beware. Um, which I sort of I went slightly haggard. You kind of did there. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't mean to. Um, so I, I, that's the other thing, too, is that it's sort of like you can't really have Harry, Ron and Hermione placed in a compromised position if they're just otherwise at with the, the feast. feast. Yeah. Um, the other thing I what I always think is kind of interesting about the basilisk is like his inner monologue. <laughs> it's just a rip, tear, kill so hungry for so long. And it's like it sounds like he is just absolutely going to eviscerate somebody <laughs> and like eat them. And it's like he's got the giant fangs and he's like, it's not like you couldn't have eaten Mrs. Norris. You know, that's true. Like, that's true. what is he doing? Why is not he eating the people? I don't know. I don't know. Like, it, oh, I'm so hungry. You're dead. I'll see ya. <laughs> well, I best be off now. Be- back Raga- to the pipes. <laughs> back to ripping and tearing. Like he doesn't rip or tear anyone. No, not even at all. Not even at all. I mean, no. Very capable of such thing. But I does, know. But doesn't do it. Um, the question I asked is, how is it alive? Because it says so hungry for so long. It's like we're talking about a literal millennium. I know. That has gone on. I know. Since, since the creation. It's of this like I think when they get down there, it says like it's eating. There's like a bunch of like dead rat bones and stuff. So it's like surviving on stuff like that. Yeah. So what but it's like, but what do you mean so hungry, hungry for so long? You're eating plenty of rats. No, he's Fine. like it's been it's been twelve hours since this morning. I it's know. so long. Ugh, I'm so bored. I'm so bored. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> it does sound like a rather miserable existence. It does. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, let's see here. There's there. We get like the description of Mrs. Norris, the like hanging from her tail oh, from the torch bracket. Oh, go ahead. Yes, we do. You're right. So you're right. Harry, Ron and Hermione are like found at the scene of the crime and are unable to escape it because of this sentence. It says um, from either end of the corridor where they stood came the sound of hundreds of feet climbing the stairs and the loud happy talk of well-fed people. Next moment, students were crashing into the passage from both ends. Like, why? Where where could be the destination of all these students that they're arriving from both sides? I know. Did, like, everyone is like, oh, well, we meant to go right. And all the other people are like, well, we meant to go left. <laughs> like, are we all about to, like, just cross each other in the hallway? Why didn't you go the other way to start? It feels like an awfully, like, field goal post shaped set of hallway systems where right. like everybody leaves the great hall either to the left and the right and then you either like go forward and take a right and then, or go forward and take a left and then we'll convene at the, like whatever this corridor the is. Bathroom. The bathroom. Is everyone <laughs> heading for the bathroom right now. <laughs> everybody's like, man, that feast. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Too much fiber in the pumpkin right. juice. I know. Got to pee. Let's go. All yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. We're, oh my God. Is that Harry and a dead cat? No way. And blood on the wall? What? It okay. was him for so, sure. It's definitely, although, although that's, here's my other thing. This is my other big 
you know, so it, it's a really it's a really bad position to be in for the mm. trio to be found essentially at the scene of the crime in in a way that is like pretty darn gruesome. Not the least of which is is again Mrs. Norris hanging in, in such a weird way, in great yeah. way. But then like you're you're watching all this happen, and I feel like a lot of people tend to think like, oh, it's probably Harry who did it. But then Draco comes out of like the crowd and goes, "Enemies of the air, beware! You'll be next, mud bloods." It was Draco Malfoy who pushed the front of the crowd, his cold eyes alive, his usually bloodless face flushed as he grinned at the sight of the hanging immobile cat. It's like, dude, students of Hogwarts, worry about that kid. I know. Come on. That second year, that 12-year-old who just pushed his way to the front of the whole school. Right. He's like, like, what like, boldness. What extreme boldness. I know. It's like, it's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. But like, I have to permit enough grace to the students of Hogwarts to where everybody is looking at the situation. It's like, dang, Harry, Ron, and Hermione were here, but that kid seems sus. There is, I think, a situation with who is the other Hufflepuff, not Justin Pinchflet. Maybe it is Justin. One of the Hufflepuffs is talking to them later, and he's like, that Draco Malfoy, he seems like a real problem. <laughs> and they're like, it's not him. <laughs> Shut up. Jeez, Hufflepuff kid. <laughs> Come on. We already did that. Have a more memorable name next time. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie McMillan, I'm pretty Ernie sure that's what it yeah. is. That's old <laughs> DA lives. Uh, the DA, exactly, exactly. Um. I also like how when um, when Draco amidst the other uh, just the Griff- just the seven other Gryffindor Quidditch players calls Hermione a mudblood. It causes such a kerfuffle as to like blows are exchanged, and now here he is, twelve year old little brat, just shouting mudblood to the entire school, and everyone's like, "Yeah, all right." Sure like sure. like the, not quite the same reaction, was it? No, no, not I mean, that's the thing. It's like you can't just go shouting racial slurs in front of an entire school. <laughs> I of know, and feel like, oh, this will be fine. Yeah, like it's like no. No, no. So, people, it, but wait, Harry, it was probably him. People are more decent than that. You know how last year he fended off Voldemort? It was probably him. It was probably him. Let's yeah. all point fingers. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> just just a just a tough overall, just a tough overall night. Bad positioning, as per always with Harry, who's just cursed with a little bit of bad luck mm-hmm. there. But that does bring us to the end of the Death Day party. And I gotta say, like I said, coming into the chapter, I didn't know that this was gonna be something. I, I was kind of like, ah, oh, the, the Death Day. And we have to. I knew. We we'd have to do it from the onset of this project. I actually had quite a bit of fun with it. So. Yeah. Anyway, there is that. Uh, do you have a review for us? Well, Ben, I sure do. This is from Hufflepuff Surprise. <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm completely shocked. I know. They're, the title of their reviews is So Much Macho. <laughs> 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 Which is a joke from our What If series. Um, uh, what if James had kept the invisibility cloak? Yes. Uh, what uh, Hufflepuff Surprise says, I have listened since the beginning of the podcast. It took me ages to do it on my podcast app. If you don't know about the title, don't ask. Question, what would happen if Ron didn't immediately tell Harry not to tell anyone about the murmurs and Harry just told Dumbledore? Hmm. Like, so if Ron wasn't like, it's not good to hear things, Harry. Don't tell anyone. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. That's a good question. Okay. So, I mean, this is this is always sort of like one of those things where I feel like I, I don't know at this point in the story if Dumbledore in access to Dumbledore seems much, much, much more limited. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't even know if like Dumbledore is intentionally trying to not spend more time with Harry in particular to permit him that opportunity to have the childhood that he kind of was deprived of otherwise. I suppose. We we know that Dumbledore specifically is withholding information on this exact basis on some level. Right. Um, but so this is like a threat that is like very like endangering the other students. It is endangering you know? the other students. Like yeah. Dumb- this is something Dumbledore should step in on. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's not yeah. like the stone where he's like Quirrell can't get it no matter what. I'm not actually concerned. Right. Right. So I'm trying to think. Okay. So let's just imagine for a second that Harry is able to get to Dumbledore he tells Dumbledore what's going on. Dumbledore is like, oh, man, this happened like 50 years ago, and that was a huge problem. Um, okay, so do you have a situation where together they discover the Chamber of Secrets and, I, and go down? I don't. I, I have to say I still kind of doubt it. 
because like the thing is, it is known to be Slytherin's monster, and Slytherin is already known to be a parcel mouth and known to be associated with snakes. And like the basilisk is known to be able to petrify people. And it's like <laughs> there's like there's petrified people and Slytherin's monster. And it's like you should all re- that's all you really should need to be able to connect the dots to basilisk. I know, especially you know? When, you, when you consider the fact that like like Dumbledore is otherwise apparently best friends with Newt's commander who wrote the yeah, book. Who wrote uh, the book. And like Hagrid literally barges into Dumbledore's office with a dead rooster. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Which is like another known like symptom of the basilisk. And the you know, like he shouldn't even know about Aragog, you know? Like I you know, there's no reason Dumbledore shouldn't be able to figure out that it's a basilisk. No, there's like, not. That, Cause that's a thing. Like the writing is literally on the walls. Literally. But like this this is one of those where us the reader is being given information in such a such a uh like a limited capacity. Yeah. And we don't know all of the existing lore surrounding uh, like basilisks in particular, but as somebody who exists inside of this world and is otherwise one of the most clever wizards of all time, yeah, it does. It seems like he should be able to reverse engineer what the heck's going on pretty easily. I mean, if you buy the book, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, like basilisks are one of the beasts in the book, right? You right. know, it like is, it's yes. not like hidden from the book. Like some of the creatures that you see in the story are not in there, surprisingly. But like the basilisk is in there, so I don't. And like Hermione figures it out, even though. Okay, but let me back you up a little bit here because the other thing that I think is interesting. Let's just say Harry goes, talks to Dumbledore. They figure it out. All it takes is the cry of a rooster to kill the basilisk. So it could be the case that that because here this is what I think is interesting. Could be the case that Dumbledore is like, I know what to do. Let's just Harry. Where are you hearing it? Like, okay. We will track down the location. Let's assume they get in there. They can bring a rooster down there. It kills the basilisk. Yeah. yeah. So Slytherin's monster taken care of. Attacks all clear. The problem is that Tom Riddle can probably still come back. Oh. The, the basilisk is playing no role. Right. It's just sort of carrying out a different mission. It is carrying out a different right. mission. Right. The Horcrux yeah. is still able to accomplish. It's like it has two goals. Yes. One is like come back. One is purge the school but like they're not really related it's just sort of like a symptom of the diary being back exactly yeah exactly so if you basically destroy the threat and nobody ever discovers that jenny's been talking to tom riddle in the diary yeah then probably jenny just goes (coughs) down to the chamber of secrets herself and just has her life force drained and does in fact die and tom riddle as as his younger form comes back to life you know what this could be another what if is like what if tom riddle didn't tell everyone he took jenny into the chamber like why is he write it on the wall oh yeah you know her, like her what bones. if you just like what if she just sort of like disappeared that night and no one really noticed and then the next morning like oh i'm back she, she was in an unfindable room right like, yeah you know, even if you noticed what are you gonna do <laughs> exactly yeah exactly yeah that's that's probably just your classic villain like monologuing like it uh, is exactly uh, what it is yeah, yeah it's just yeah. one of those things it's like the monologue is it's it's so funny like the movie the incredibles makes fun of like monologuing because yeah. every single time i ever watch any superhero movie or any villain based movie ever i'm always like and they're monologuing. And they, they're monologuing. They, they have to they get. Can't the, not do they it. They need the credit for the brilliance of their plan. Yeah. So much that they have. They have to explain it. They have yep. to explain it to the hero. Um. Anyway, so there's. Have that. you ever read the um the graphic novel Watchmen? I I've only I've seen Watchmen, but I have not read Watchmen. It is so. There is a great scene at the end um, with uh, the villain Ozymandias. Yes, and he's doing the whole monologue thing, and they're like, "Why are you telling us all this? We're going to stop you." And he's like, "I wouldn't tell you all of this if I hadn't already succeeded." And he like opens the screen, and it's like it's done. Yeah, like, yeah. I did it like ten minutes ago. Are you stupid? Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a, and that is it's such yeah. an incredible way to turn the trope on its head. It's yeah. sort of like it's like yeah, it's like I am monologuing because it is over because I already won. Like yes. game. Yeah. <laughs> See ya. Game set match. Yeah. Checkmate. Yep. Boom. Not me. Not Hermione. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So that 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 finishes us off. That does. That is gonna that is gonna do it for us uh, today here on Through the Gryffindor. But join us next week where there is some fantastic chapter artwork for the writing on the wall as we venture forth into uh, chapter nine here on Through the Gryffindor.